In January of this year, the field of special education lost a dear friend, Jim Gallagher. He was a strong and powerful voice of advocacy, reason, and leadership in special education. Jim was adamant about the importance of translating research to practice. He was a pioneer in highlighting the critical role of effective child development services and early education programs. Jim spent 13 years at the Institute for Research on Exceptional Children here at the University of Illinois. He was also the first director of the then Bureau of Education for the Handicapped in Washington, D.C. We had asked Jim, who worked closely with Sam Kirk, to provide some remarks for our symposium, and he had graciously agreed to do so. Jim knew the history behind special education at the time of Sam Kirk's work and had written his speech, which his family graciously agreed to share with our audience. We are joined today by Jim's wife, Ronnie, and two of his four children, Brian and Sean. Would the Gallagher family please stand to be recognized? And now I'll ask Brian to come to the podium. He'll share his dad's remarks titled, Remembrances of James Gallagher. Thank you. Um, I am Jim Gallagher's youngest son. So for all the millennials who are here, that makes me Gallagher 4.0. <clears throat> Uh, and since I really don't have a background in special education, I'm not sure I'm on the who's who's list. I'm probably on the who list. <laughs> uh, I hope you'll indulge me for a moment before I start uh, my dad's remarks. On behalf of my mother, my siblings, Sean, who is here, Kevin, Sheila, our spouses, Peggy, who many of you know, Nancy, Lisa, and the Gallagher grandchildren, Thank you for all the acts of kindness that were offered by the people in this room and the people who will be watching on the webcast and the digital record. From the video tributes from the doctors Turnbull to the cards and letters to the kind words uh, in newspaper articles, journals, and other publications, each act uh, was a great act of kindness that touched us deeply and we appreciate it. One of these acts of kindness was the offer of the opportunity to come here uh, given to us by Mickey Ostrovsky, Mary Kalansis, and Mary Elaine Hughes to present uh, the remarks that my father prepared about Sam Kirk. My father was very excited about this event. He was happy that Sam and his groundbreaking work was being honored in this way. Evidence of this excitement was the fact that he finished the speech three months before it was due to be given. This goes against a great legacy in the Gallagher family of coming in at the last moment and squeezing in great work just before or occasionally after deadline. <laughs> but Dad was very aware of his age and wanted to make sure that his thoughts about Sam got on paper. So in mid-January, Dad uh, came to my mother, who was his lifelong partner and, many of you don't know, his lifelong editor, and uh, gave, him, uh, gave her a presentation of the address. Mom said, that's one of the best things you've written in quite some time. And he said, I hope I get a chance to give it. Dad passed away the next day. But I think it would get him great satisfaction to know that his last original work was his tribute to his mentor, his colleague, and his dear, dear friend, Sam Kirk, who my siblings and I knew as Uncle Sam. <laughs> Portrait of a leader. It is always nice to visit the monuments of past achievement like Valley Forge or Gettysburg that remind us of the significant events in our history. I feel the same way when returning to Illinois to remember the beginning of the Institute for Research on Exceptional Children and discuss the leader of that enterprise, Sam Kirk. To help me with this effort, I brought along a book published. I did not bring the books because we are now distributing Dad's library to various places, and we were able to drop off some things here yesterday. Um, entitled The Foundation of Special Education, Selected Papers and Speeches by Samuel A. Kirk. I will be quoting from those during this address. I am pleased to have a chance to reflect on the legacy of Sam Kirk, a man who embodied the essence of special education in his actions and his accomplishments. I first met Sam in Michigan, where I was beginning my career as an assistant professor at Michigan State University. Actually, it was so long ago that the title then was Michigan State College. 
Sam wanted someone to lead a team of graduate students to collect some data in Michigan. On the basis of this experience, I was invited to teach two summer sessions at the University of Illinois, and then offered a job at the Institute for Research on Exceptional Children. He enticed me with the directorship of two projects, the tutoring of brain-injured children and the adapt adaptation of highly gifted children in the regular classroom. This essentially set me on the dual path with children with disabilities and children who are gifted for the rest of my career. My wife, Ronnie, and I were not overwhelmed with the prospect of living in central Illinois and planned to live here only three years. We ended up spending 13 years here and made lifelong friends in the process. And I am delighted that Bob Henderson and Laura Jordan are still around. Sam achieved so many firsts that if you were in the Olympics, the weight of all those gold medals would tip you over. Let me remind you of some of his firsts. He was the first to do, with Merle Carnes, an intervention study on young children with mental retardation. He set standard for later research on efforts on intervention. He believed that intelligence should not only be measured, it should be enhanced. Quote, in the chapter, The Educability of Intelligence, Binet presented a curriculum to develop memory, attention, reasoning, and language, and other vectors of intelligence. In other words, Binet was not obsessed with the constancy of the IQ, but believed it can be changed through educational intervention." End of quote. Sam was the first to establish a multidisciplinary research center for children with special needs, the Institute for Research on Exceptional Children. More about that later. He was the first to set up a viable special education program in the state of Illinois in partnership with Ray Graham, a director of state special education programs. Illinois became one of two or three states with a comprehensive special education program. The first to write a textbook on educating exceptional children. I am pleased to bring with me the 14th edition of that book that still bears his name as senior author in respect for the work that he has done in the field. On the third edition, Sam invited me to join him as co-author, whose task was to pay particular attention to children who were gifted and children with emotional disturbance. I have been with that textbook ever since, and later with the help of Nick Anastasio and Mary Ruth Coleman. Sam was the first to coin the term learning disabilities that sharpened our understanding of these children and revolutionized the field of special education. Prior to the introducing this term, these children were labeled as minimal brain injury because even without a neurological diagnosis, the thinking was that the unusual patterns of development observed in these children could only be caused by some damage to the brain. For my own part, I always felt that minimal and minimal brain damage should refer to the confidence we had in the diagnosis rather than the children themselves. Anyway, Sam said that brain injury was a neurological term and we are educators, so we need to come up with an educational term to describe them. And so the term learning disability was born. As he said, quote, originally we conceived of a child with a learning disability as one who has a major psychological or neurological impediment to the learning of reading, spelling, writing, or arithmetic. These are relatively rare cases, probably only one to two percent of school children. Today, however, the term learning disability applies to nearly every kind of learning problem a child may encounter, end of quote. He continued, recently I've used the term learning disability to describe a group of children who have disorders of development in language, speech, reading, and associated communication skills needed for social interaction. In this group, I do not include children who have sensory handicaps such as blindness or deafness because we have methods of managing and treating deaf and blind students. I also excluded from this group children who have generalized, generalized excuse me, mental retardation. Sam was the first to create a diagnostic test, the Illinois Test of Psycholinguistic Abilities, the ITPA, created to profile the strengths and weaknesses which could later be the basics of remedial actions. It was used less than anticipated because one, it had a ceiling of nine years, and two, there were many fewer children with interesting developmental patterns than he anticipated. He was the first special educator to go to Washington to work for a year, organizing the Division of Handicapped Children and laying the basis for groundbreaking federal legislation to aid handicapped children. 
Because of his experience in Illinois, he was well aware of the huge chasm that existed between the academic community and public policymakers, and he was determined to do something about it on the national level. He was the first chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Handicapped Children. More about that later. He was the first to receive the Steuben Crystal Statue from the Kennedy Foundation on international awards for his contribution in the field of mental retardation. Of all of his awards, he was probably the proudest of this one. He was the first to write with his wife, Winifred, a highly distinguished professional in her own right, a book for parents of children with disabilities entitled You and Your Retarded Child. His comment on the role of parents was, if I were to give credit to one group in the country for the, advance, for the advancements that have been made in education of exceptional children, I would place the parent organizations and the parent movement in the forefront of this leading force. This is something we ignore at our political peril. Let me make some personal comments on a couple of these first. All in all, I think the establishment of the Institute was the greatest and most long-lasting of his achievements. If one considers differentiation as a most important concept in special education, and that differentiation can be divided into two major parts, instructional and organizational. Instructional refers to the interactions of a teacher or therapist with a child or several children designed to meet their special and specific needs. It is a differentiation that an expert teacher does with a student. But such differentiation can be limited by a number of other forces, namely the knowledge and the skill of the teacher, the teacher's responsibility for the remaining students in the classroom, the lack of appropriate space or materials, the lack of knowledge that anyone has discovered for the best strategies for teaching exceptional children, et cetera. So we need organizational differentiation that can produce the research, the personnel preparation, the technical assistance, the demonstration centers that illustrate best practices. The Institute on West Nevada Street was a fine example of organizational differentiation. We are fond of referring to education as a team game, but how do you organize such a team? Sam brought together sociologists like Bernie Farber, psychologists like Larry Stolrow, Carl Bereiter, and myself educators like Bud Colstow, Bob Henderson, and Laura Jordan to work together on problems that required the diverse skill of a multidisciplinary team. I would be remiss also not to mention Herb Goldstein. Although Herb had begun his work at the Institute as a graduate student, he came with vast experience in education and became a key part of the team. Putting these people in one or two buildings on West Nevada Street was one thing. Getting them to work across disciplines was another. One of my favorite times was the coffee hour around 9 to 9.30, where we would sit in the conference room and draw on the continuous coffee pot in the kitchen and gather to talk about art, politics, professional issues, and form a bond that served us well over the years. All of this experience with the Institute gave me the confidence to direct the center at the University of North Carolina the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute, a multidisciplinary center which took on major questions that could not be handled by a single investigator or a single discipline. Now, as many of you know, I was the director of the Bureau of Education for the Handicap, the first director, in Washington, where new legislation was created and created an organizational difference. But many of you do not know the role that Sam played in that appointment. I was on sabbatical leave at Duke University when the legislation was passed establishing the Bureau, and they were looking for the first director. Sam suggested that I should do the job, but I was not enthusiastic. I said I was only a college professor who knew nothing about Washington and who would be out of place there. I then received a series of phone calls from special educators around the country. The theme of the phone conversations was that, Jim, you have to take that job. You're the only one in the country that can do it. I found out much later that Sam had set up a phone tree for all these folks to call me with that message. <clears throat> Someone I knew in Washington later asked me why I took the job, and I told him the story, and he laughed, and he said, they pulled that old chestnut on you, <laughs> that you were the only one who could do the job. The funny thing is that that ploy often works, mainly because the person being told the story secretly believes it to be true. <laughs> That was not the last of Sam Kirk or his influence in Washington. There was the National Advisory Committee that was established by legislation to provide wise counsel and advice to the Bureau. 
I submitted a list of eight or ten names and even suggested that Sam Kirk be the chairman of the committee. It was submitted to the White House. Later, I was told the list was returned with Sam Kirk's name crossed off. I was astonished and asked for the reason. Turns out that Sam Kirk had been adamantly opposed to our adventures in Vietnam and wasn't bashful about writing letters to the editor and making speeches about our role in the Far East. President Johnson was not favorably inclined to anyone who criticized that effort, and the White House was aware of Sam's opposition. I talked to my superiors about this, saying that Sam Kirk was considered the father of special education and that it was unthinkable that we would have a national advisory committee without him on it. Such an omission would not demean Sam Kirk, but it would demean the President of the United States. And I did not want to spend the rest of my career explaining to people why Sam Kirk was not on that committee. Well, we went around and around on this, and finally they gave in, they gave in and they said, all right, you can have your Sam Kirk. But there was going to be a big White House ceremony with the President welcoming the advisory committee, and that's off. <laughs> well, I guess I said the equivalent of so be it. <laughs> Anyway, the advisory committee gave us some of the greatest advice that served us well during my three years there. One of the suggestions that the committee made was to aggressively maintain contact with the professional field and parent organizations. Sam had observed that once in Washington, people tend to be involved with the internal problems and politics of Washington and tend to forget the people they were supposed to be serving back home. We took that advice quite seriously and set up seven regional conferences around the country, brought together a hundred or so leaders in special education in each of these regions, and asked them to tell us what our priorities should be. We decided to take the entire leadership of the Bureau to the first meeting, the director, the deputy director, Ed Martin, three division directors, and the head of planning all attended the first meetings. We thought after that, one or two of us should go to the subsequent six meetings. Well, the first meeting at West Point was such a roaring success that we decided to take all the leadership to each of the, meeting, each of the future regional meetings. We found that the priorities were quite similar from one region to another. For example, they all said that training of special education teachers and their leadership was a crucial factor. This gave us the confidence that we were on the right track as we pushed for funds for higher education personnel preparation programs. The priorities that they mentioned were turned into program directives for us, and we used those regional priorities as arguments back in Washington for research, personnel preparation, demonstration programs, and the like. An additional advantage was that the persons in the field were aware of what we were doing at the Bureau, were eager to support us with letters and phone calls since they were we were doing exactly what they recommended to us. Some people have said this process, the seven regional meetings, all took time and money. They asked, couldn't you have gotten 10, re 10 knowledgeable persons in a room and gotten the same results? The answer is probably yes, but we wouldn't have had the degree of public support that resulted from the meetings, which was so important over time. So the results of public input were positive. One possible glitch that, we did not, that fortunately did not materialize was when we were flying into Denver for one of these conferences. We had an aborted landing that could have wiped out the entire leadership of the Bureau. We have thought about from time to time how special education might have changed had that plane crashed. I may be accused of putting Sam up for sainthood, and I'm not saying that. He had many quirks, among which were smoking the worst smelling cigars this side of Cuba. We were all glad when he decided to chew on them and not light them up. I will mention one quirk that he would approve of. At the age of 50 plus, Sam took up a new hobby golf. He attacked it with the same energy and drive in which he handled everything else. He and Winnie had a home right on the Urbana golf course, which helped a lot. I remember visiting him in his retirement phase, still working, of course, at the University of Arizona. He invited me to play a round of golf. I played my usual mediocre game, but he had one of the best games ever and beat me by a couple of strokes. I said, Sam, you've got to burn that scorecard. I don't want anyone to know I was beaten by an elder elderly retired professor. <laughs> sure, Jim, he replied. When I came into the office the next morning, I found him gleefully showing the scorecard to anyone who was around with a detailed stroke-by-stroke -stroke description of how the round went. <laughs> Sam was always interested in the future, so I want to close with one of his visions that has yet to occur. 
Sam said, to solve many of these problems, I suggest we create a national center for the study of politics, practices, and issues in special education. The center should not be under governmental auspices, but should be privately endowed with sufficient funds to guarantee its independent, independent existence for many years. It should be apolitical and free of pressures from private interest groups. Its function would be, one, to study periodically practices in universities and colleges in the, preparation in, in the preparation of professional personnel and to make recommendations for improvement. Two, to evaluate the practices and service delivery by local, state, and other government agencies and to make recommendations for improvement. Three, to study current research productions and recommend directions for research. And four, to investigate current responsibilities of local, state, and federal agencies, and to make recommendations for the adequate division of responsibility. This center should be staffed by a small group of the most objective and knowledgeable scholars in the field who would be free to publish their results of their studies and deliberations and call, for, call a spade a spade without fear of political or financial recriminations. The independence of the center should be clearly delineated in the charter for its existence. In that one hope for the future, Sam tried to deal with the political and professional influences that he knew were eating away at the quality of special education that he had hoped for. Well, the most that any of us could ask for in life is that when our brief time here is over, we could say that our tenure here made the life of people better than if we hadn't been here. In a passage of the revision of the introductory text that we wrote after his passing, we honored the fact that there are thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, of children and parents around the world who may never know the name of Sam Kirk, but will know and will have benefited, excuse me, but will have benefited by what he has accomplished here. I am pleased that he gets remembered in the way that he has and pleased to be a part of it. Thank you. <laughs>